Hi, everyone. My name is Kenny Coogan, and I'm the Education Director for the International Carnivorous Plant Society. Thank you for joining us for another exciting webinar. Today, we're going to be talking about the hurdles of starting a carnivorous plant business. And uh, Matt Thomas is going to be doing the presentation all the way from Australia. Our website for ICPS is carnivorousplants.org. I have some exciting news. In May of 2024, we will be at the Schönbrunn Palace in Vienna, Austria. This will be the 14th international conference. We usually have them every other year, but because of COVID, we had our Japan conference in 2023. So this is two conferences back to back. We will be taking 2025 off. So save the date. May 24th, 25th, 26th, we have the conference where we have presenters from all over the world talk about cultivation, conservation of carnivorous plants. It's a nice blend of people just growing them for fun and then scientists. In addition to those three days, we probably will have one or two field trip days. So stay tuned. This should be all announced around November of 2023. All right, the International Carnivorous Plant Society is, right now we're at about 1,500 paid members. And like I mentioned earlier, these are scientists and backyard uh, gardeners. If you go to our Facebook page or our Club Express page, you will see that we have different events going on. So you can pencil those in. And if you can't attend the live recording, we post them on our YouTube channel a couple of days after the live event. On our YouTube channel, we also have five animated videos for the beginner gardener. Or if you're a school teacher, you're definitely welcome to utilize these beautiful animated videos. If you look at my shirt, I have a World Carnivorous Plant Day shirt. This is the original World Carnivorous Plant Day. And this year, it is, it's always the first Wednesday of May. This year, it's going to be May 1st, 2024. And uh, what's cool about this is we get over 24 videos on that day. We release them one every hour. And it's uh, scientists and authors and research people from all over the world. And we put all of these videos on our channels that day to celebrate the wonderful world of carnivorous plants. If you want to help with conservation and education of carnivorous plants, you can become a member. Something exciting about the membership is that you get access to our seed bank store where you can get low, low priced carnivorous plant seeds. And as a reminder, the seed bank is only as good as our members make it, which means if you have surplus seeds, we would be happy if you donated them for our members. Something that I'm really proud about is that this year was the third annual Carnivores in the Classroom grant. Historically, we've been able to fund about 20 teachers. This year, we were able to fund 50 teachers who teach kindergarten through 12th grade all over the world. And uh, through the help of some awesome nurseries and individuals around the world, we were able to ship to the teachers directly $150 worth of carnivorous plants. In February of 2024, those teachers will be writing a little report, a little paragraph and some photos to show uh, the progress. So we want to thank all of these wonderful, wonderful organizations to who help sponsor our Carnivores in the Classroom grant this year. And if you want to help the Carnivores in the Classroom grant or our other initiatives, you can buy cool merchandise like a Nepenthes Bical Karate Tote or a mug or a t-shirt or a long sleeve with lots of different designs. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, save the date Wednesday, May 1st, 2024 is the next World Carnivores Plant Day. If you have content that you want to share, please send me a message and we'd love to uh, advertise that. And if you're attending this live, please, if you have questions for Matt, please type them in the chat box below. Well, thank you everyone for coming. 
Um, I just wanted to start this presentation by acknowledging um, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people as the First Nation, as the First Australians. Uh, we recognise their cultures, histories, and diversity, and the deep connections they have to lands and seas um, where those of us in Australia are residing. Um, so I thought I'd just start by giving you guys some background on who I am and what my experience has been in this hobby. Um, so other than carnivorous plants, I also collect um, a lot of other plants um, and I've got quite a few marine and freshwater fish tanks as well. So I've got some stingrays, lungfish, and coral, and that kind of stuff. Um, I think having a broad range of interests um, is helpful for me to um, think of ideas that I can maybe take from one area and apply it to something else. Um, I've got four dogs as well and uh, four birds. I didn't put any photos of them in. Um, and I also collect a bunch of other plants that aren't carnivorous as well. So um, begonias, genariads, aroids, um, you know, pretty much the kind of stuff that will grow with nepenthes and other more shade tolerant carnivorous plants. Um, so to give some background on why I decided to start up a nursery, um, I thought it would be good to explain um, some of the challenges that Australians face uh, in the hobby over here. Um, so the first challenge um, that I think most people come up against if they want to get into this hobby is the availability or um, the lack thereof of carnivorous plants. I'm so sorry. Two seconds. Um, yeah, so th there is a... Uh, great difficulty that new collectors will find trying to get any kind of carnivorous plants over here, um, other than your you know, really common stuff like Drosera capensis, uh, spatulata, that kind of thing. Um, Nepenthes especially seem particularly difficult to get over here a lot of the time. Um, case in point, this is uh, Nepenthes enormous, um, which I was looking for for about four years before I finally found one. Um, and just because of the rarity over here um, and the fact that it was on eBay, um, it ended up costing close to $1,000. Um, so it's difficult for beginners to get started um, if you don't have the money to spend on a hobby like this. Um, it's quite limiting for some people, um, which is um, disappointing, I think, because I think the hobby over here could be a lot bigger um so just some other plants which are quite difficult to get over here so this is um Ampularia black miracle um they were going for i believe around 800 dollars um and this one's clipiata um the first ones of these over here went for about 800 dollars um and now i think they're around about 400 um so they're coming down um but yeah it's still it's difficult to get what you're looking for most a lot of the time um, another quite um, bizarre phenomenon, I guess, is um, the difficulty in getting our native carnivorous plants. Um, there's over 190 different species uh, native to Australia, but getting any of them other than things like Drosera binata um, can be incredibly difficult. Um, so here I've just got some of my native carnivorous plants. So um, the first one's a hybrid. Uh, the second one is Drosera falconeri, and the third one is Drosera uh, audensis. Um, Pediolaris complex Drosera, very difficult to get in Australia. Um, I think it's a combination of um, the fact that you can't self-pollinate them uh, and the warm conditions they require. Um, there are some very warm areas in Australia, um, but the majority of the areas where people live are... Um, subtropical to warm temperate um, and those winter temperatures aren't very good for lowland plants um, so i'm trying to collect some more plants like these so that i can propagate them and produce pure species and make them more available um, we've also got some native nepenthes here as well um, so this is uh, nepenthes mirabilis uh, which i saw recently in brampton beach it's the southernmost population of nepenthes we have here in australia um, we've also got Roman A, 10X, and Parvula. Um, you will occasionally find um, Mirabilis in the hobby over here, but you're very, very unlikely to find any other species. Um, there's occasionally Mirabilis uh, crosses Roman A available, um, but that's the extent of that usually. 
Um, what I found quite frustrating recently was um, being in Japan for the ICPS conference um, and seeing huge amounts of our native plants available um, and not being able to buy them or um, get them back over here. Um, there's just not really anyone growing and propagating them. Um, there are a few older collectors that do have quite large collections, um, but due to the fact that they're not nurseries, um, they're not producing things to sell. Um, so it can be um, quite difficult to get a lot of these plants over here. Um, another one of the issues is we have a lot of extreme weather. Um, so the first photo is one of my greenhouses, the first one I built actually uh, about three years ago. Um, it was during a drought when I built it. And then a few weeks after that, the drought broke um, and we had torrential rain for a week or two, um, which softened, softened the ground um, and the supports that I'd hammered into the ground collapsed, unfortunately. Um, the second photo is a later greenhouse that I built. Um, and before I had a chance to bolt it to the slab, um, some windy weather we had picked it up and um, threw it into the side of the house. Um, so I had to start again on that one too. Um, another issue that we have over here as well is there's not a lot of knowledge being shared other than um, your kind of basic level stuff. Um, we do have lots of very experienced and talented growers over here. Um, but I think it's just a factor of um, they're not so active on Facebook, which is where a lot of the hobby is these days. Um, very fortunate that the Brisbane branch of the Australian Cannabis Plant Society has just restarted. Um, so it's really good to connect with growers um, locally and in person. Um, so I first got started selling plants with three or four years ago online in a serious way. I've been trading plants online probably over 10 years now. Um, so I, I got started looking into it more seriously when I moved um, a thousand kilometers south to a small city called Wollongong with my partner. Um, it was in January 2020, um, right before COVID um, arrived here in Australia. Um, and unfortunately, we had spent our savings um, on the move and then um, our work dried up because of the lockdown we had here. Um, we were quite fortunate in that um, the price of a lot of aroids here um, increased dramatically um, and we were able to sell um, some of the plants that we already had, um, namely Singuronium stamarchii and um, the one on the right hand side is a Frydeck. Um, so yeah, we were selling between five and ten of these plants or cuttings a week and shipping them out around the country. Um, and a lot of people expected um, what they were calling Insta-ready plants. Um, so I had to adapt to um, pack everything so that it arrived with, you know, no damage um, and you know, turn up in essentially perfect condition. Um, and I was also quite fortunate uh, that I was, once I got um, some more work, I was able to sell these to um, expand my collection of nepenthes and obtain some good breeding stock. Um, so after my first greenhouse collapsed, um, I wanted to build a more, I guess, professional greenhouse. Um, it was quite difficult because um, where we were living was on the side of a very steep hill. So there wasn't much um, flat land I could utilize. Um, so we ended up building a structure out of PVC pipe that would fit onto our balcony. Um, and I believe that was five meters by two meters, so, um, quite spacious. Some of the things I drew in that shade house, it, uh, it worked really well down there. Um, for those of you that don't know, Wollongong is just south of Sydney. So it's a um, more of a warm temperate climate. Um, the temperatures for most of the year are quite ideal for growing highland intermediate nepenthes. Um, I did struggle with lowlanders and some intermediate hybrids that favored the warmer end of things. Um, but for the most part, I was able to grow things a lot better than I could in Brisbane. Um, so first one I've got here is Loia Bavicii by Bavicii. Um, and I've got, uh, going from the top down across, sorry, I've got um, Truncata by Bavicii. Um, 
Aime by VGI, by VGA, um, Sumatrana by Loe by VGI, um, Adriani by VGA, um, and a Platy Kyla hybrid. Couldn't tell you exactly what that is, sorry. I've got quite a few and they all tend to look very similar. Uh, the next one is um, Nepenthes Predator, which is Truncata by Hamada. Um, that's one of my oldest plants. I've had that for probably seven or eight years at this point. Um, the next that is just your Truncata by BGI. There's a few more plants I was growing there. So we've got um, Tobiaca by Patty Kyla. Um, Rock Road Bosciana by VCI by VCI. Um, another um, Adriani by VGI. Um, Town Genesis by VGI. Vibrata. Um, Loya by Ventricosa. Um, another Paddy Kyla hybrid. Um, I'm not sure if it, the correct way to say the next one is Rocco or Rocco. Um, a lot of people here say Rocco, but I've heard a lot of people overseas call it Rocco. Um, this is Vichii and then Glandulifera by FBR, which is one of my favorite plants. Um, so after I moved out of that greenhouse, we moved to a, another property that had uh, a large slab that we could put a, a, a hothouse on. Um, you saw the previous photo where the, the early version of this didn't survive. Um, bought a new one and bolted it down immediately. Um, found things did a lot better than the previous location just because it didn't have any issues uh, with humidity. Um, it can get quite dry in that part of New South Wales. Um, so having it enclosed was uh, quite beneficial. Um, in this setup, I did have some issues with uh, light. I had to whitewash the exterior of the greenhouse to reflect uh, some of the heat. Um, but that reduced the amount of light getting to the Nepenthes. Um, the leaves were a bit bigger than they should have been otherwise um, and probably didn't get as good uh, colour as I could have from them either. Um, in this setup, though, I had a lot of flowering happening and I was starting to um, breed again. Um, as I said earlier, I was able to um, sell a lot of my aroids to buy large Nepenthes uh, that I was using for breeding. Um, I also managed to make... Um, just under 350 cuttings as well from my stock plants um, that were not far away from being sold. Um, these are some of the plants I grew in that greenhouse. We've got uh, Eustachia by Boccarensis, uh, Tenuous by Flava, um, Loia by Vichii by Vichii, um, Maxima Wavy. Um, I actually won, um, I believe it was Best in Show, the New South Wales Carnivorous Plant Society show that year. Um, next is Lavicola, um, Rosilla Flora Giant, Truncata by Fibiata, um, Loia by Vichii, Loia by Edwardsiana, and Fibigia by Veloso. Just a few more as well. Um, first one is Maxima Dark by Stenophila by Loia by Rocco by Vichii, I think. Um, next one is Vichii. Um, the next one is very complex. Um, one of the parents is Truncata by Campanulata, and the other parent has about eight different species in it. Um, the next one along is quite complex too. There is 12 species involved in that one. Um, don't ask me what they are. Um, another complex Platy Kyla hybrid. Um, Loa by Vichii by Vigia. Um, Truncata by, sorry, Loya by Truncata, Truncata by Fipiata, another Platicala hybrid, and Rocco by Bosciana by BCI. Um, and then just small Platicala hybrids, um, Predator, BCI, and Vigilia. Um, things are going really well, and I was starting to get a lot of plants ready to, um, to sell and um, had a lot of seed being produced as well that I'd sown. Um, but unfortunately, I had to move back to Brisbane um, at that time. Um, managed to pack all my plants up and fit them in and um, ship them back up to Queensland. Um, unfortunately, um, I had a lot of fungal issues from, during the few days they were in transit. Um, and when I unboxed them, a lot of the plants um, were completely dead or had um, crown rot entered. 
rotted through the bases already. Um, I did build a new greenhouse up here. Um, prior to collecting in Brisbane previously, I didn't have a greenhouse. I grew into lights on my balcony. Um, so this has been a learning experience for me. Um, it's a lot hotter up here. Um, and the backyard where I, I'm living now um, doesn't get any sun in winter and gets almost full sun in summer. Uh, so I had a lot of issues um, after losing those plants um, later in the year um, when the, the summer sun came out and um, burnt a lot of things as well. So um, it's been a bit of a tough year for me, but um, I'm getting back on track um, and I'm moving inside um, and growing under conditions that I can control. So these are some of the plants I was growing um, outside here though. Um, pitches aren't as big or as impressive as they were down south. Herbigia um, uh, bivalosa, uh, Basiliana, Hamada, Vigilia, um, Nebularum cross, Truncata, uh, Truncata giant, a uh, complex hybrid from Exotia plants, um, Gothica, Ventricosa vitris mediensis, and Vichio. Um, so just during this time period where um, a friend of mine offered for me to um, import some plants through Borneo Exotics through him um, so that I could resell them. Um, I did an initial order mainly just for myself um, and I was planning to sell the extras to um, just cover my costs. Um, I ended up deciding that I wanted to pursue it full time. Uh, well, not full time, but as a, a, a proper venture, I guess you could say. Um, so this here is my first lot of plants that I brought in. Um, one challenge we have here in Australia is our quarantine laws. Um, it's quite difficult to bring in uh, ex vitro plants or plants that have been grown by cutting or seed. Um, they have to go through a three month quarantine period and be completely free of any pests or diseases. Um, it's quite difficult to do. And in those three months, um, the plants will be in a facility that you can't access, um, being looked up by someone who doesn't specialize in, um, often doesn't even specialize in horticulture. Um, so you can expect quite high losses as well. Um, that means that in Australia, we only really get access to um, plants in Borneo Exotics who will ship here um, in vitro um, and Louisiana Tropicals, which will do the same as well. Um, I traveled to Japan um, early this year to try to network and meet some contacts who um, would be willing to send some plants over to us in vitro. Um, fortunately, nothing um, came of that. It's um, complex and um, there's a risk as well um, for the people sending you in vitro plants that um, someone could take their clones and produce them themselves. Um, so I completely understand why people don't want to do it. Um, it's just a little bit frustrating being stuck on this island when we can't get um, these plants in. Sorry, I'm just trying to see the chat. I'll check that at the end. Um, so yeah, these are my, um, so I ended up moving inside, um, just because it was too unpredictable, you know, during winter, I would have no sun, um, and my plants would you know, really not look good. The pictures would be small and green. Um, the leaves would get quite large, um, and there was just not much bigger. Um, and then when summer comes around, um, those you know, soft atoliated leaves are not going to stand up to the heat and the, the sun that we get here in Australia. Um, so I built a tent, um, mainly for growing out seedlings and um, stock plant, uh, sale plants. The larger plants are mainly outside still. Um, just, it's cool. Electricity in Australia is very expensive um, and to, to grow that many plants under lights would cost a lot and also cost a lot in cooling as well. Um, obviously it gets quite hot here in summer um, and these lights do produce a lot of heat. Um, so as you can see, they're mainly small plants in here. Um, the large plants outside there, 
they're fine without um, the I guess, more consistent conditions. Um, I just don't expect them to pitch so well. Um, but we're currently looking for um, a new location where we can set up a greenhouse that would um, be usable outdoors for my collection um, and then uh, sales plants and stock plants. Um, I don't have a photo of the whole tent set up. Um, fortunately, I'm not um, here right now to take a photo of um, I thought I had some, um, but it's essentially just um, two racks, like the first rack here that you can see side by side, uh, and then a smaller rack to the left. Um, and I go in one end and there's a pathway down the middle. Um, one thing I found moving them inside is um, obviously the leaves shrink quite a lot um, under the more intense lighting. Um, that for me, that's the thing I prefer. I'd rather compact plants with larger pitches. Um, but the market here seems to prefer plants with um, larger greener leaves. Um, so that's definitely something for me to keep in mind in the future. Um, people would definitely prefer um, a larger plant over a smaller one that's been grown under high lighting conditions. Um, so with my next lot of plants I'm bringing in, um, I've got some new lights to try with them and I won't be growing them out for as long either. Um, I lot, had a lot of feedback that people prefer plants that were less advanced um, for a more affordable price. Um, so I'm happy to you know, grow some out, but also sell some a bit earlier for people who would prefer to do that. Um, this top layer here is a lot of plants that I'm growing out at the moment for um, stock. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's quite difficult getting plants here. Um, so I've been trying to buy up what I can. Um, a lot of people do bring in seed. Um, and if you're lucky, you might be able to buy an extra plant or two from them. Um, so I've got some exciting things growing out at the moment. Um, and I'm looking forward to breeding with them down the track. Um, these are some of the plants I've got growing in the tent at the moment. Um, a lot of these I've been looking for for um, quite some time. Um, and a lot are just ones that I happened upon that um, I thought would have potential. Um, so the first one up here is uh, this tenuous. Um, it's a male clone from Borneo Exotics. Um, the next one is Mulawensis. Um, I really like the small dark pictures on these. Um, something I aim to do in the future with my breeding is um, focus on producing um, more compact or small nepenthes. Um, a lot of the plants out there today, uh, while very beautiful, also get very large. Um, and I think that um, really limits the people who can collect them, um, who live in apartments or other small spaces. Um, the next one here is uh, Truncata by Peltata by Loei. Um, then I've got Mollus by Vichii, um, Pemata by, Harry, uh, by Haryana. Um, below so it's the Borneo Exotics clone, so it's quite hardy. Um, Halloweenensis by Bordiana. Um, this next one is probably one of my favorite plants at the moment. It is Angelatifolia by Edwardiana. Um, I'm hoping that it stays relatively small, um, but I'm not quite sure with Edwardiana being one of the parents. Um, what I do really like about it though is the very dark picture body with the um, yellow comparison that doesn't darken. Um, next is just a beachy eye. Um, and then again, I've got the Hamada by Haryana. Um, so yeah, after I grab my plants out, put them under uh, um, some lighting. Uh, these ones here, I didn't have under the um, stronger grow lights. Um, they were under a weaker ones still, um, but you can still see that the some of them are still quite small. Um, so. I really wanted to try to take photos of the actual plants that were for sale. Um, there's a lot of sites that will just, you know, use a stock image and then you don't know exactly what you're getting. Um, unfortunately, um, while I thought that the scale was quite clear because I was used to seeing these plants and pots um, in person, um, some people didn't um, get the scale and thought that the pots were, um, you know, 80 mil or um, 100 mil pots where they're 55 mil and 70 mil. Um, so I've learned that I've got to include um, something for scale with all my photos um, because it's obviously quite disappointing 
you think you're getting a larger plant and you get it and it's fairly small. Um, the here I've got um, Singalana by Hamada. Uh, next is Maxima Wavy. Um, these have been a bit tricky because they are not increasing in size. Um, they're growing lots of leaves, but they're still growing in that kind of way that a lot of tissue culture plants do after they've been hardened off. Um, so I'm hoping soon that they'll start increasing in size and um, lose those juvenile characteristics. Um, and the next ones are Maxima by Ramespino, which you know, are really popular over here. Um, so the, my website launch went really well. Um, I was selling things um, kind of privately before that. Um, one big thing that I wanted to do was um, make a website so that um, people who are new to the hobby um, can, you know, they can Google Nepenthes for sale or carnivorous plants for sale um, and you, know, you get some options to buy from. Um, the last year or two has been quite exciting. We've got lots of different um, people starting to sell and nurseries starting up. Um, and we've got exotica plants, obviously. Um, they breed some beautiful plants, but unfortunately, um, the priority is to send plants overseas, um, which is understandable. The market here is quite small. Um, and if it were me, I also would prefer to just um, package up one large order for Europe and one large order for the States, then have to send you know, 50 small orders all around Australia. Um, but we do have some other um, people coming into the scene. We've got um, Pitcher and Moss. Um, I've bought lots of plants from them. Um, Eat Me Exotics. Um, They've got some really good stuff. Uh, Ollie is breeding a lot of his own plants um, and he's taking a lot of cuttings. Um, it's good because it's different to what a lot of other places are offering, which is um, you know, your Borneo exotic stock, which is also what I'm offering at the moment too. Um, you've also got Ivan's orchids and then Brandon at UNEPS. Um, yes, so um, obviously there's a few people selling Borneo exotics plants here. Um, so. To try to differentiate myself, I wanted to supply people with um, pots and media for their plants. Um, I use an inorganic media um, for several reasons. Um, what prompted my switch to use it for pretty much everything was um, we had a shortage of um, New Zealand sphagnum moss in Australia. Um, it completely The supply here completely dried up, um, then it was replaced with Chilean sphagnum moss, which is not as good, but it was still usable. Um, and then that supply dried up too. And then we, we were being sold um, sphagnum moss from China, which had a very alkaline pH and a very high TDS, um, which um, resulted in some people losing quite a few plants. Um, we can get this sphagnum moss here again, um, but I'm very happy with the results I'm getting from the inorganic media. Um, it's allowing me to fertilize a lot more, which is allow my plants to grow a lot faster. Um, if I was using sphagnum media, um, it would break down quite rapidly. Um, aside from the penthes, which are my main focus, I'm also trying to obtain and propagate um, some other genera um, that are a bit difficult to get here as well. Um, there's quite a few people collecting pinguiculas here now, especially people who um, were previously collecting houseplants. Um, I think they're amazing. They're, I, I like the geometric shapes they have in the flowers, which you don't get in a lot of other carnivores. Um, I've been trying to obtain as many species or hybrids as I can that are not well represented here um, so that I can propagate them and um, make them more available in the hobby. Um, also trying to do the same with um, Drosera and Utricularia. Um, it's very difficult to get even uh, what are some of the common species overseas here in Australia, um, took me nine years to finally get Madagascariensis. Um, now that I've got it though, I've been propagating it and I've got 11 plants. Um, so hopefully this year I'll be able to sell some and some people will be able to get it. Um, I've also got Patricularia, uh, Betty's Bay. Um, it's quite difficult to get here too. Um, I've known a few people that had it over the years, but they lost it. Um, so to, to obtain that and be able to propagate that, just um, share around, it's quite exciting for me. Um, also got some helium flora, um, my first attempt at growing them other than a couple that I tried a few years ago that didn't work out very well. Um, so far it seems to be so good. Um, 
and I'm not sure how quick they'll be able to propagate them for um, sale. Um, so my some of my plans going forward. Um, uh, I'm sorry, some more background. Um, you've got recently we've got a fair few poached nepenthes appearing in the market here in Australia. Um, that was one of the main drivers for me to really look at this venture as a um, something I wanted to do quite seriously. Um, you know, I was seeing these poached plants come in, um, which is a devastating loss for them in their natural habitat and for the community as a whole um, is eventually, you know, um, as we've seen with the Viata, um, species can go extinct in the wild. Um, so one of the things I've been really wanting to do is to um, get some um, species and hybrids going in tissue culture. Um, Joe, Nurse and Manuel from um, Flora Vitro um, really encouraged me to look into it seriously um, and I was quite lucky. A friend of mine um, does have skills around that and we have um, kind of partnered up and working on a few things. Um, one of the most exciting things that is on the go um, and don't want to count my chicken before they hatch, but I managed to get some Edwardsiana seeds from Jeff Schaefer. Um, so we've got them down and hopefully we'll be able to produce um, some Edwardsiana clones that are produced from horticultural plants rather than um, poached plants, which is um, the easiest ones to get over here, unfortunately. Um, I'm also looking at um, producing it's um, the other more uncommon carnivores. Um, often they have a lower price point and they are um, they take up less room than the penthes. Um, so I think that is a big draw card for a lot of people. Uh, I don't have much space. Um, and I'm also looking at other plants that can be grown with nepenthes. So I've got um, lepenthes um, that we're producing at the moment. Um, and I'm also producing lots of gisnerids and begonias from leaf cuttings and seed. Um, I've actually been line breeding some of the miniatures and ninjas. Um, so hopefully I'll have them for sale in the near future. Um, in regards to breeding, um, what I would like to do is to use some of the species that haven't really been used for hybridizing yet. Um, things like Mikei, Tentaculata, um, Tenuous, so that's been used a bit recently, um, but I think it's got a lot more potential that can be um, exploited still. Um, I'd really like to see some different plants other than your, you know, flared peristome, the colorful stripy pitches. Um, they're very beautiful, but there's a lot more diversity out there that I think we could achieve. Um, and I think Jeff has already um, kind of conquered that scene. So I'd, I'd like to do something that's um, different from what everyone else is doing. Um, I think I've covered everything. Um, I'm not, not sure that I've, if there's anything that I've missed. Um, I guess the overall goal of my business is to be able to make plants or carnivorous plants available um, year round for people to buy. Um, I think I mentioned earlier, but that's one of the most um, demoralizing things for people who want to start collecting nepenthes um, and also other carn carnivores is it's um, quite an elitist hobby at the moment. Um, you've either got to have enough money to go after the eBay auctions that everyone else is going after, um, or you've got to know people who will sell your plants in a private collection. Um, until recently, it hasn't been as easy as just you know, jumping on Google and looking at what's available. Um, we've only really had exotic plants and they only sell um, lately at once a year. Um, but yeah, as I mentioned, we have um, myself, uh, Fanged Foliage, um, but Kai at um, Pitcher and Moss, Ollie at um, Eat Me Exotics, um, Ivan Ivan's Orchids, Brendan at New Naps, um, and my friend Sam is also um, starting up a business down in Tasmania. Um, one issue we have here in Australia is you can't actually send plants to all states in Australia. Um, so I'm lucky that I'm in Queensland because I can send to the majority of the states, um, but there are three that you can't send plants to. Uh, which is in Northern Territory, Western Australia, and Tasmania. Um, so it's good to see as well that there's some people starting up um, in those areas so they can supply the local market there because um, it's quite difficult to get the plants in otherwise. 
Um, yeah, does anyone have any questions for me? Thank you, Matt. That was fantastic. You have a lot of questions because a lot of people are interested in the uh, subject and the topic. So Neil says, do you think there's anything that the aquarium industry has worked through that the carnivorous plant industry could learn from? Yes, definitely. Um, the aquarium industry, I think, was definitely probably earlier, especially the marine um, side of things. They were the first to adopt the use of LEDs. Um, I remember when I first started growing plants, um, the advice was to use like uh, T5 or T8 um, bulbs from, uh, we call it Bunnings here. Um, I think you guys have Home Depot or Lowe's. Um, uh, yeah, the lighting, I think it's definitely come a long way. Um, I think a lot of that has come from uh, reefers and the research they've done. Um, and then obviously you had your hydroponic stuff come through as well. Um, but yeah, the advances in lighting has really allowed you to grow a lot more um, plants inside. Um, previously, a lot of these plants, you know, you wouldn't be able to achieve the levels of light that we're able to achieve now without um you know really heating things up and spending a lot of money on electricity and light fixtures um another thing probably i've seen from the marine industry too is they have a tendency to name everything that's, that's slightly different so every corals for you know, a different name some of them are a bit silly um i don't know where the industry is going here um it's getting a bit ridiculous though with some of the um names for some of the very complex hybrids we've got um, but i don't know what solution there is um, in other areas of plants that i collect like just nariads um, breeders will keep all their seedlings um, cull everything other than maybe you know one to five plants that show the best characteristics um, and then they'll name some of those plants after they put it through trials to make sure it's consistent um, and it performs well in lots of conditions um, before they'll then clone that plant and release it. Obviously, with Nepenthes, it's not that simple. You can't just um, easily take um, tissue from a Nepenthes and put it in tissue culture. Usually, you have to start from seed, which um, has a lot of difficulties because you don't actually know what the plants are going to look like before they are saleable. Yeah, so you can't really just slap a name on um, a whole batch of seedlings because... Um, you have such a wide range of what the seedling is going to look like, especially in com complex hybrids. Um, you're going to have some that are really ugly. Um, you know, I've bought lots of plants from Exotica plants over the years. Um, their breeding is phenomenal, but, um, you know, as with any batch of complex hybrids, there are always going to be some duds. Um, so I, I'm not sure where we're going to go with um, names, but um, I'm hoping that there is some sort of resolution in the near future. Peter asks, what goes into your inorganic soil mix? Um, varies a lot depending on what I'm planting and what I have available. Um, I had issues here where you've got a really good product that's working really well for you, and then all of a sudden it can't be imported anymore. It's become too expensive, or the government's decided it's um, got organic matter in it, which you can't let in. Um, so it, you know, changes a lot, um, but generally it's um, a mix of Akadama, Kanama, um, Pumice, and Scoria. Sometimes if I can't get Pumice, I'll swap it for Perlite. If they don't like Perlite, it goes green and it floats. Um, sometimes I'll use Kitty Litter, which is um, like a zeolite clay, um, but that can be inconsistent. Um, and for my ping, I'll often include some uh, crushed limestone or coral sand. Um, and then um, you can see some, like with my trusser, I've just um, covered the soil with kanama. Um, that's just because I don't like when the um, the moss from the peat starts growing. Um, so I try to cap it so it doesn't grow. So Neil says, thanks for the honesty on the one million things that can go wrong. I think it's really helpful for people like me in their first year of an Nepenthes business. And Thank you. Um, <laughs> It's, um, it was a difficult year. Um, 
other than the losses I told you about, I also um, went to Japan twice this year. Uh, the first time was in January, of, uh, February rather, which is one of our hottest months here. Uh, and I lost quite a few plants because they weren't watered um, as often as they should have been. Um, so it's been a, a tough year, but um, you know, what you can do is get back into it, take a bit of a break if you need to, um, and try it again. There's always things to learn, always things you can do differently. Josh says, thanks for saying the thing about the ruler in the online sales. Do you have any other website tips? I like to try to include multiple angles. If it, you know, some plants look better from one angle, I like to try to show um, the bad spots as well, I guess. Or, you know, I just, I don't want people to be disappointed when they get their product. Um, yeah, I think I find with Nepenthes and is people um, know what they want to buy. Um, so I try to include you know, the blurb from Bonium Exotics um, and then some things I really like or write my own uh, content for as well. Um, but people usually know what they're after. Demi asks, how many days of the week do you ship? Do you ship bare root? And how many days does it take to ship to your customers? Like what type of mail system are you using? Uh uh, so I use our post system here called Australia Post. Um, it is great when it works and um, not great when it doesn't work very well. Um, generally, I'll try to ship on a Monday. Um, often, I uh, actually own a couple of other businesses. And I run a charity, so my time can be quite limited. Um, so I'll ship on either a Monday or a Tuesday. Um, and they generally will arrive next day or within 48 hours. Um, but sometimes, you know, things just don't get scanned. They look like they're sitting somewhere for three or four days before they arrive at a destination. I, um, I bought some plants two weeks ago um, from someone who was about 60 kilometers north of me. Um, the plants went directly to Western Australia, which is on the other side of the continent. Um, don't know how far it is. It'd be a few thousand Ks. Um, you actually can't send plants there, uh, which is a bit concerning. Um, went to a few spots in Western Australia, then down to Victoria before I came back to Queensland. Um, and it was in transit for about two and a half weeks. Um, but um, the main thing, I guess, you just have to expect those delays. You need to pack to accommodate them. Yeah. Maybe related. Ryan asks, do you have a refund or a guarantee policy on your website? Um, I have a small policy about it. Um, I don't accept returns just for change of mind. Um, if someone is unhappy, I will uh, look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. I really don't want people to be disappointed. Um, but also, in my experience, selling plants online, people can be quite unreasonable. Um, a few years ago, I had someone um, that I sold a plant to on eBay return the plant because there was a spider on it. <laughs> um, but generally, if there's any issues, I'll um, send out a replacement and whoever, the plant they got, if it was damaged, they can keep that as well. And fingers crossed it survives. Pawa says, thank you, Matt, for sharing your experience. How much of your business are carnivorous plants versus non-carnivorous plants? How important was it for you to diversify, especially in today's market? Um. My market at the moment is predominantly carnivorous plants. Um, I got a bit over propagating with the aroids. Um, and I don't know if it was the same in the States, but here in Australia, the market crashed about two, about two years ago. Um, so things that were selling for you know over $1,000 very rapidly dropped to $100 or $200. Um, a lot of these plants can be quite large and they're not as easy to ship as a lot of carnivorous plants, um, especially if you want the leaves to arrive without any blemishes on them. Um, so for me, it's not as worth it um, producing that kind of stuff. Um, just takes way too much time packing. Um, I am working on producing more um, of the smaller stuff like four terrariums and, and I, don't know, I, I, I like small plants. Um, that they probably won't be ready for another few months. Um, so yeah, at the moment, only, I think only Nepenthes I've got listed online, um, but I would probably foresee the split being you know, maybe 30% non-carnivorous plants down the track. 
Yeah. All right, man, we got three more questions. Unless anybody types in anything else. What are your tips for marketing and networking to promote a new carnivorous plant business? And I'll just say, Jane says, where you live, do you have an in-person carnivorous plant society that meets? Um, so yes to that first question. Um, we have the Australian carnivorous plants, oh, Australasian carnivorous plant society here in Australia. Um, I used to attend meetings in Brisbane, which is where I live now. Um, would have been say five years ago. Um, there was not much interest. Um, there's, when I was going, there was maybe five people that would go. Um, it eventually kind of died off and went away. Um, when I was living down south in Wollongong, I went to some of the um, Sydney or New South Wales um, branch meetings, um, and I had a lot of encouragement to get something started up here. Um, I was able to get the wheels moving, and then um, some of the people who were involved previously took over and got it worked out. So we've been meeting now for be about five months in person, month to month. So it's really good being able to meet in person. Um, as some marketing, um, I found the biggest thing to do is just you know, help people. Um, if people ask questions online, share your experience or advice. Um, if you don't know what you're talking about, or you're not confident, I would not say anything. Um, and you'll get a screenshot and you'll be put up in the Pete Posters group or something. Um, yeah, I find just talking to people organically is the best way. Um, been very lucky I've got um, some good friends in the States who have provided me with a lot of advice um, and through them I've met some other people who've been able to help me. Um, in the lead up to my website launch I um, posted a lot on Instagram and Facebook. Um, I was quite fortunate I had already had an Instagram page for my kind of for my plant collection in general um, so I was able to just rebrand that and I had a, an audience ready to go. Um, we've also got some local Facebook groups that I would share my social media posts in. Um, and, you know, just I think the excitement of having a, a new source of plants um, just gets people looking here. It's um, not like you guys where you can just jump online and you've got three or four different options you can buy from year-round. All right, the last question. It summarizes your talk perfectly. It's from Hoa. If you could give your past self advice for starting your business, what would it be and what mistakes would you have been able to avoid? Um, probably the biggest one is um, the, the first lot of um, plants I imported, I actually lost the entire batch. Um, it was when I was um, in Japan, when I lost a lot of other plants as well. I mean, just being so small and um, they'd only been hardened off uh, for, I think, about eight weeks. They just didn't survive, unfortunately. Um, if I could go back in time, I would absolutely I don't know, put some wicking mats out or something or try to set up something automated um, because no one's ever going to look after your business as well as you will. Um, and I found that across not just this business but many others. Um, well, the other thing as well... Um, I wouldn't grow the plants out for as long before I sold them. Um, and I grew these out for, I think, about six months before I sold them. And obviously, that has to be a cost reflected in that. Um, and you know, when you import, when we're importing things, it's I think it's about the same price that you can order things from, but they're, um, they're only, they've only just come out of tissue culture. Um, so they need to be hardened off and grown out uh, before they can be sold to so the price. Um, increases because of that there's also a lot of fees involved in getting them into australia um and yeah going forward i'll be um selling maybe half of them at a younger stage that won't be as they won't look as good and they won't be as hardened off um but some people definitely would prefer to be able to grow it out themselves and save a bit of money and buy some more plants um and the shipping could be cheaper for them too. It's a smaller plant. Um, it doesn't make too much of a difference here. You pay a set fee. A flat rate. Uh, yeah, up until half a kilo. Okay. Um, my biggest cost in shipping is including the media. Um, I've had a few people say that they appreciate the media and some people say that they 
don't appreciate it. So I thought about maybe um, you can have like a drop down menu and you can choose to get it or not. Um, but I think each pot weighs about 130 grams. Um, so if you buy like four plants, it goes over the, the limit and into the next bracket. But at the moment, I'm just absorbing, absorbing that because it's not too much. All right. Well, thank you, Maya, for discussing the hurdles of starting a carnivorous plant business. I know the people who attended this live appreciate it, and I imagine all the views that are going to come once we post it because everybody loves this hobby, but they also want to make a little profit from it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, thank you for inviting me. It's um, quite far out of my comfort zone to do something like this, but I'm um, glad I was able to do it. Um, and just for anyone out there listening as well, um, one of the biggest things I'm looking for at the moment is um, seed. Um, so if you are someone who is producing your own seed um, and you're happy to either sell some or come to some sort of arrangement, maybe you get a commission or something from any plants that we sell, um, please do reach out. I really would love to grow the hobby here in Australia and make more of these plants available to Australian collectors. Matt and I met at the Japan conference. Do you think you'll be going to the Austria conference? Yeah, definitely. I've got, um, I'm going to Europe in December this year. Um, so I'm just going to reschedule my gonna, flights. You should just stay for the five months. <laughs> <laughs> you do that. I don't know what I come home to. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. And uh, for those listening, I hope Matt and I see you at the Vienna Austria conference this May. May 24th through the 26th of 2024. And thank you once again, everyone who attended this live. And thank you, Matt. Thank you. It's not a surprise that gardeners, educators, and scientists are fascinated by these unique plants. The International Carnivorous Plant Society, or ICPS, not only love these plants, but welcomes growers just getting started all the way through professional scientists. The ICPS even started an annual World Carnivorous Plant Day to celebrate them. The free online event is held the first Wednesday of May. Take a look around our website and you'll find historic documents about carnivorous plants, growing guides, free educational resources, and more. Have questions? Ask. We don't bite, but our plants do.